Lighthouse Church, it is great to be here this morning. Amen. Amen. I mean, that, that praise and worship session was out of this world. It was out of this world. Sorry for the pun, but it's out of this world. His name is Jesus. Come on. Everything we do here at Lighthouse Church needs to be about Jesus. Amen. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Leon. I'm one of the leaders here at Lighthouse Church. And it is once again a great honor and a privilege for me to come and share God's word with you. The good news of Jesus Christ with you here this morning. I take it very seriously. I take it very seriously. There's a lot of prayer and there's a lot of preparation work going into these preachers. And I, and I must tell you what an honor and priv privilege it is to share God's word with you this morning. Amen. And so I just want to start off with, with a word of, of with, with prayer. Can we, can we start off in the right place? And so, Lord Jesus, I just I thank you for the opportunity here this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word that is true. Your word is the truth. And Lord God, that we can speak and learn and read out of your word, the truth, here this morning. I pray, Lord God, for revelation in our hearts. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would operate and move now during the preach, that you would cause fresh and new revelation. I commit this time to you now, Lord God, in your mighty and precious name. Amen. Amen. So I'm excited this morning. You know, this morning we're going to be continuing with a series of the parables of Jesus. And, and this morning is no exception. This morning we're going to be talking and carrying on and, and, and uh, talking in terms of the parable of the prodigal son. Right? The prodigal son. Have you heard about the prodigal son? Some versions of the Bible call it the lost son. I think it's an amazing, an amazing parable that we are looking into here this morning, and it's, it's great to be part of it, because the prodigal son is all about what I see as the path of life. Recently, about two weeks ago, I had the privilege of riding the Sani to Sea. I don't know if you know the Sani to Sea. It's a mountain bike race, right? And it goes from Sani Pass down to, 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 to Scottborough, and it sounds all downhill, but I promise you it's not. <laughs> I promise you it's not, okay. But I want to tell you something. It's, it's a path through that weaves its way through the Zulu land of KwaZulu-Natal. It's an amazing path. It's, I, I've actually got a video clip. I wanted to share it, but it would just take too much time where guys are riding down the Umko drop, and it's, it's left, it's right. It's going on switchbacks. It's, it's dodging that rock, dodging that rock. It's under a tree. It's over a river. Man, it's exciting. Woo! I want to do it next year again. <laughs> but isn't that what life is all about? Isn't that what life is all about? It's getting onto, onto that path and let's tackle it. Let's tackle this path, right? That's, that's what I experienced in the last two weeks. When they show that video with the pros going down this mountain, I'm like, whoo. Natalie just looked at me and said, I hope you don't do it like that. <laughs> yeah, they're wild. They're wild. And so today's parable is one that focuses very distinctly on the path we as people need to walk on, based on, on decisions that we make. Decisions are the things that we make in our lives that determines this path that we walk on. And there's many different things. There's, there's things where we, this morning I'm going to be covering very pertinent topics. And one of the topics is decision making. Decision making. Some of the other topics that I'm going to be covering is, is discerning what is genuine and what is imitation. What is genuine? And what is that imitation to that genuine article? And this morning, I'm going to be covering the revelation of how humility trumps pride every time. Humility will trump pride every time. Every time. And so... This morning, the objective of this preach and the objective, I believe, of this parable is, is all about the grace of this almighty God of us. This almighty God that has so much grace. Grace. Natalie teaches on it at the foundations course. And, and she often, every time, she says, do you know what grace stands for? 
and lots of you have heard the teaching, but the G-R-A-C-E stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. We're talking about grace this morning. It's what the parable is all about. And I want to take some time this morning. We're going to read through the whole parable. Right? You got a problem with that? No, I trust not. I trust not. But this, we're going to be reading a lot of scripture here this morning. And I'm not apologizing for that because we need to get more and more into God's word and reading it. And I'm going to read there from Luke chapter 15 from verse 11. It says, Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. That's inclusive of that portion of the estate, right? Got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, that's a lot of spending, eh? That's a lot of spending. There was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, or then he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come home, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused, refused to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has been, who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home and you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's the parable Jesus shared with his disciples, with the people. And so that's the story that Jesus used. And I find it absolutely amazing. The best teacher, I believe, that has ever lived, who has ever walked on the face of the earth, used stories to get his point across. And so the son was, was a slech, man. Hey, I don't know other word for it. Hey, he, he went and he took all his, his inheritance. He went and squandered it, wasted it on prostitutes and wasteful wild living, it says here. And here he comes back, says, has a revelation. And he comes back and he says, father, my father, I've sinned against heaven and against, and against you. Make me one of your hired servants. 
This is quite a reality that's happened here in this story. And so this morning, I want to I wanna elaborate on some of the main points of this story. And my first point that I want to focus on here this morning is decisions of life and death. There are decisions that you and I need to make that concern life and consider death in our lives. And that path, you know, I spoke about a path that we ride on with Sony to see. If you take the wrong path, you're not going to get to the destination. You've gone off on a tangent. You're not going to get to the finish line. You're not going to win. Why? Because you made the wrong choice. All right? And so we, we read about it there in that parable. Luke 15, verse 13, it says, Not long after that, the young son got together all he had with that estate, that portion of the estate he had. Set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. He made a decision. He made a decision. I'm out of here. Father, boy, what's out there is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that thing. And off he went and he took all that inheritance that he had with him and he squandered it. And so the son made a decision to leave his father. It was a decision that we can see because we know the parable was a decision that was not life but created death in his life. It was a wrong decision. And then we also read in Luke chapter 15, verse 18, it says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And he went back to his father. He made another decision. There was a decision making happening within this parable. And I want to say to you, we sit every day with decisions that we need to make. Is it a decision of life or is it a decision of death? And I want to share something more a testimony of something I've personally experienced now at the Sony to see, that cycle race that I rode. It's a three-day race. It goes over three days, 265 kilometers, and you cover 90 kilometers in the first day. And me and my partner, Michael, Michael van Koller, some of you know him, he comes to church, not here this morning. I think it's maybe a good thing, maybe not a good thing. But I want to honor him here this morning. I want to honor Michael. He was my cycling partner. When we got to the second water point, we met with our wives, and it was awesome, and we, you know, our wives were seconding us all the way down the trip, and not even a kilometer after the second water point on the first day, there was a new portion of path. You could see it was newly created, and there was a, an incredible amount of rocks and very uneven ground we had to navigate through on this portion of, of the path that we had to ride on, and I was behind Michael. And as he was pedaling and navigating through, there was a rock on a corner that was turning to the left, just on the inside of that corner that, that was jutting out. And as he, as he went past that corner, his pedal on the left side clipped that rock. And we were going at, at luckily not a breakneck speed, but we were going at a, at, a, at, a, at a tempo, and it was enough to throw him off balance, and in Throwing him off balance, he was going to fall. And there was a tree right there that he tried to grab onto to stop the fall. And he missed the tree and he fell with his arm behind him on the ground. And he's quite a big guy. He's a big, strong guy. And he's, he fell on that arm and he, he, he hurt it. He, it was a nasty fall. It was a nasty fall. We are 24 kilometers from the, from the end of day one. And he managed to get up uncleat, get up, dust himself off, and he had this incredible pain in his shoulder, and it was bad, it was bad. And he said, come Leon, we're gonna carry on going. For the next 24 kilometers, he rode with that shoulder in pain. And they changed the route. They, they decided this year to make the last end bit that goes down to McKenzie Club downhill, and boy, did they promise us a downhill. It was, it was a serious downhill but it was one of the bumpiest downhills I've ever ridden in my life. Because you go down, you've got to pull brakes, and your bike is just jumping. And he's normally faster than me on the downhills, but I could see he's lagging behind on this downhill. When we stopped at McKenzie Club, he went straight to the doctor, and the doctor said, Michael, I'm sorry to tell you, but it's the end of your race. 
you've hurt this thing. You've torn the tendons in your shoulder. You went to physio and they put plasters all over the shoulder. He said, that's the end of your race. That's devastating because he had just done over 2,000 kilometers of training for this race. That's a lot of kilometers that, that he had done in training for this race. The amount of money and all the things that you do to enter the race and accommodation, all that stuff, just seems like, oh, it was all just, it's come to the, just the day one. But I want to tell you something here this morning. Michael made a decision. He made a decision. He said, I'm, I'm not going to lie down here. My partner, his partner, needs support. And he got up the next morning and he was the best supporter a rider could have had. He got in there, his whole arm is strapped. Let me tell you something, this guy's still in pain, he's on painkillers. It's strapped. Water point one, water point two of day two. It's a rough day. Day two is a rough day. He's there, he's supporting. And everyone else, it's like he knows the whole cycling community of Secunda, that guy. Right? He helps everybody. He can hardly move this arm, but he's helping everybody with one arm. And there is so many people that he's helping at the water points. Natalie was there. They were our seconders, but he's there. He was organizing the ladies, saying, get this, get that, quickly do this, do that. There was guys that had brakes because of the downhills that were so vicious. Their brakes had stuck. <laughs> they had melted together. The brake pads were finished. He was in these guys' brake pads fixing bicycles. He was doing this. That was what decision Michael made. He realized, my race is over, but it's not over for those around me. I'm going to step in and make a difference. I'm going to step in and make a difference. And he made a difference to such an extent. Day three was, was, was awesome. It rained. <laughs> it was mud, mud everywhere. Can you see, are you, I wish you could have seen that guy getting mud out of everybody's tires just to get them going and out of their gears. Michael's race hadn't ended yet. His race hadn't ended yet. He made a decision. I'm going to throw all my weight into this, irrespective of the circumstance that has happened to me. Irrespective of the circumstance. He made a decision. He made a decision. And so the path of life requires us to make decisions. You need to make decisions of life, make decisions of death. The decisions that we make can result in others reaching the, the end goal or them not reaching the end goal. The decision you make, it may be a circumstance that's happened in your life. It doesn't mean you lie down there and you, and you die. There's a decision that we can make. Irrespective of my circumstances, I can make a decision. I'm still going to make a difference. And I want to encourage you here this morning. You have opportunities. Life throws us those rocks that come across our path. Life throws us those rocks. Do you know there's the prodigal son? Life threw him a rock, and you know what? He fell. He made the wrong decision. But he made another decision at the end of his life or somewhere else in his life that was the correct decision. I want to encourage you here this morning. The decisions you make in your life impact you and they impact the people around us. There were people, I'm convinced, that Michael helped, that if they didn't get his help, they wouldn't have finished that race on day three. I'm absolutely convinced. Absolutely convinced, because day three was rough. Day three was rough. Day two, there was mechanical breakdowns. Michael got involved. He was even ready to take his own bike that he couldn't ride anymore off the back of his bike rack so that someone else could go and finish the race. What decisions are you and I sitting with that could be the right decision instead of the wrong one? The decision of life or the decision of death? I want to encourage you here this morning. Make the life one. Make the life decision. Amen? Amen. Point number two. Wow, I'm running out of time already. <laughs> Point number two is genuine or imitation. Genuine or imitation. 
this one is a big one for me. I had such a revelation recently, and I'm talking about a month ago. I was invited to, to a corporate golf day. It was great. You know what? I didn't even have to pay for my round of golf. The golf carts were paid for everything. Even there were stalikis in between the, the, you know, the stalls, between the holes, where you could go get biltong and cool drink, and, and they just handed it out. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. This is awesome. Biltong and Built on, good thing, golf, good thing, mixed together, great thing, right? Okay. <laughs> but what I started noticing was some of those stalls that were between the holes were starting to if, uh, offer people, the players, the, the, the golf players, a different kind of refreshment. It was a different kind of refreshment. And I actually found a picture of that refreshment, if you could just, yeah, there we go. I don't know if you, you guys don't know what that is. I know, because you guys go to church. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, that's called a shooter, all right? And I don't know what's in there, but that's what's in there, the pink stuff, pink stuff. I hear people laughing. I hope it's because you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's pink stuff. And it suddenly became more and more evident to me after every hole, they were offering more and more of these things. And the more and more of these things that were handed out, the better my golf became in comparison <laughs> to everyone around me. It was, it was encouraging for me, but very, very eye-opening for me as well, because I had a revelation there. I had such a revelation on the golf course that day, because you know what, Fonny, can you help me out? I want, to, I want to share something with you this morning. That thing over there is imitation. That thing over there is the imitation of the real deal. Do you know what the real deal is? You can show that picture. This. In point number one, I mentioned we need to make decisions in our lives. And if you choose imitation picture, it's an imitation to the, to the genuine article. This here represents the blood of Jesus. This here represents the body of Jesus that died for me. I will drink this one. You know that even on the, just before we started playing the 18th hole, there was a young lady there who had had a little bit too many of that pink one, I think. And she was telling everybody, you cannot play the last hole unless you've had one of those pink ones. And I looked at that young lady and I said, young lady, you don't know what you're talking about. Because I don't want the imitation thing. I want the real thing. And I want to encourage you, you know, the prodigal son, he saw something out there in the world. What the world was presenting him was something that looked very attractive very good looking, very, makes you inquisitive. What does that thing taste like? But let me tell you something, don't be fooled. Hell's marketing department is doing very well. <laughs> this here is the real deal. I want to tell you something. The world offers imitations the whole way through. You can go look at Galatians 5.22. It's full of the fruits of the Holy Spirit where it speaks about love. Do you know the imitation is lust? That other relationship outside of your marriage that is ungodly is an imitation. I want to tell you something. It's an imitation. You know that other fruit of the Spirit called peace? You know, peace comes from the name of Jesus. True peace comes from Jesus. True joy comes from Jesus. 
It doesn't come. Mark. Mark is the guy that's running these rehab centers. His biggest job is to get guys off the imitation and get their eyes on the genuine article. That's his biggest job. Am I right or wrong? Get your eyes off the imitation, guys. It's fake. It's fake. And three of those pink things, you go one, two, three, you're down. And the next morning you wake up with a bad headache. You wake up with a bad headache. Guys, leave the imitation stuff. And I want to tell you something here this morning. I've got it here. The revelation of what is truly genuine needs to happen before we make decisions. A revelation of what is truly genuine needs to happen before you make a decision. The prodigal son made a decision. I'm going to follow the imitation. Where did it lead him? It led him to knowing what is the genuine article. He had a revelation and he came back to the Father. Amen? Amen. Point number three of the priest here this morning is humility trumps pride every time. Humility will trump pride every time. Luke chapter 15, verse 21 to 24 says, The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That son took that whole inheritance that he had. He wastefully spent it on, on wild living, prostitutes, an ungodly lifestyle, second to none, where he realized I don't even have money enough to feed myself. He was stout, man. He was really naughty. He was really naughty. He was really bad. In Luke 15, verse 22, it says, But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. I want to tell you something here this morning. I've got to tell you this. You can be a hundred miles off that path that God has got for you, but it takes one step of faith. To get back onto that path. It just takes one step. It takes one step of faith. It doesn't matter how slack you were, how bad you were, how naughty you were, how you were pulled into the wrong direction, going, gyring off the path God's got for you. It takes one step to get back onto it. Because there's a father there's a father with his arms wide open saying, welcome home, my son, my daughter. You know what? It's called grace. It's called grace. It's called grace. There's a father. I want to tell you something here this morning. It doesn't matter how bad you've been in your life. What you've got up to, please take that one step back on the path God's got for you. Because he's going to open your eyes to those things that are the imitations. He's going to open your eyes up to the reality of what the marketing of hell is, is creating us to be pulled into constantly. Like the prodigal son was called into or, or followed into. God has got a beautiful plan for your life. One step back on the path that God's got for you. It's called grace. It's called grace. Some of you may be sitting here this morning saying, well, I don't think his grace is big enough for me. This parable Jesus spoke, he spoke it so that we could have a revelation of the love of a father, of the love the father has for you. He wants you to come home. I want to tell you this morning, Prodigal sons and daughters sitting here this morning. The father is standing with his arms wide open. He's waiting for you to come home. He's waiting for you to come home. He loves you. He's going to celebrate you coming back to the path that he's got for you. It's a much better, it's a preferred future God's got for you. I want to tell you here this, this morning, 
Lord, I pray for this revelation. I pray for this revelation of your children here this morning. Lord, we just thank you. Can you close your eyes? I'm going to pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord God, for your word that is so true. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have been sent. That you have been sent. Lord, Lord Jesus, that you ascended to heaven as we celebrated this week. But you sent the helper, the comforter. You sent him. Lord, we pray that our ears would be open to you, Holy Spirit. I pray for spiritually deaf ears this morning to be opened. I speak to the spiritual deaf ears this morning. I say, open in the name of Jesus. I speak to the spiritually blind eyes this morning. I say, open in Jesus' name. I pray for the discernment, Lord, to recognize the genuine article as opposed to that imitation article. I pray, Holy Spirit, that we would know your voice this morning. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you create this revelation in our hearts this morning. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And while all heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and I know there was an invitation made earlier, and I'm not going to call you to the front, but if you're sitting here this morning, and you need to make that one step, that one step, doesn't matter if you've given your heart to Jesus or not, but this morning you need to make that one step. You could be a hundred miles off the path God's got for you, but you need to make that one step this morning. I'd like you to just, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. His hand's going up all over the place. There's a decision that needs to be made this morning. Come Holy Spirit, come. There's a father that, is, that has got his arms wide open to you and he's saying, come back home. Come back home. I have a preferred destiny for you. I have a preferred future for you. If you've put your hand up, you can put it down again. Lord, I pray for every hand that was up now. I pray for a decision to be made this morning. A hot decision to be made this morning. I thank you, Lord, that the current way of work will change. The current circumstance will change. And Lord, that the decision that has been made here this morning is to return to the Father. I thank you for that here this morning. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your Holy Spirit that's ministering to us here this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for the power of your Spirit. Power of your Spirit. Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy. I think God's just ministering to people here this morning. Just allow Him to minister to you. Just close your eyes. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for my life. Thank you, Lord. It's not a life that's, that's worthless. It's a life that's got purpose. It's got direction. Lord, we thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. Minister to us, Lord. Reveal the truth of your word to us here this morning. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We honor you. We praise you, Lord God. We praise you, Lord God. Come, Holy Spirit.